Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Well, it's a beautiful day. We're here at the Long Beach Naval Shipyard in Long Beach, and I'm standing here with John Ryan, who is the, you're kind of the head public affairs guy here, yes, right? Yes, Hugh, I am. Welcome on behalf of the 3,100 employees of Long Beach Naval Shipyard and the 1,500 support employees of the Naval Complex. And I'm happy to have you here today and show you about Long Beach Naval Shipyard. Boy, that was an official welcome if I ever heard one. <laughs> <laughs> now, we are standing here in front of old Herman the German. That's the crane that has been here since 1948, 49. 49. Great history to it. It was built by the Nazis during World War II. Right. We confiscated it after the war. It's been here ever since. And really, it's kind of a symbol of the shipyard. It's so large, you can see it from all the freeways around here. Yes, it is. And uh, she's been here, as you say, since 1949. And one of its big attributes is lifting Howard Hughes's spruce goose. Really? Yes. And a matter of fact, it's in the Guinness World Book of Record for largest lift physical size. Now, actually, I know a lot about that because we came down here and did a program That's right. for one of our California's Gold programs about Herman the German. That's right. But I've been wanting to come back to the shipyard ever since because this place really fascinates me. Unfortunately, you've been in the news a lot lately because it seems like every time one of these hit list come out for closure. Uh, the shipyard is originally on the list, and that's how we've kind of heard about it in recent years. That's right. Uh, the shipyard has been recommended by the Defense Department for, for closure, but they submit their um, recommendations to the Defense Base Closure and Realignment Commission, and they'll make their final decision, that independent commission will make their final decision on 1 July. So it's kind of up in the air right now. That is correct. Well, we're here in a very non-political way just to find out what's going on here. And you wanted to start the program here by this huge hole in the ground. That's right. Dry dock number one is the largest dry dock in California. It's over 1,100 feet long and 140 feet wide. Its concrete flooring is, a, is 27 and a half feet thick. And it's the largest dry dock, as I said, in, in California, capable of dry docking any of the Navy's ships, including, any? including aircraft carriers. An aircraft carrier can fit into here. That's correct. Well, now you brought us here, but there's not much activity going on here. Right. So why don't we go on over to the USS Antietam, which is a Aegis cruiser, and show you what we really do. Our mission is to repair and fix and overhaul surface ships. Why don't we? Sounds great. <laughs> Now, as we walk by, Louis, turn around and take a look out here because we've got a beautiful day out here, and you've got a ship docked out here. What's the story on this one? That's the S X USS Ajax, which the is the X USS Ajax. Right. It's a decommissioned ship. It's one of the ships that uh, is no longer in use for the Navy. It's awaiting disposal. What does disposal mean? Disposal probably will be used for scrap be so sold that, for scrap. That ship's on the way out. That's correct. How many ships does the Navy have now? Uh, approximately 370 or so ships. 370 ships in the Navy in now? In the Navy now, yes. I thought there were like 600. No, there were uh, almost 600, oh, back in the Reagan administration time frame. But uh, due to defense cutbacks and the end of the Cold War, those ships have uh, decreased now. Now, is this a Navy shipyard? That's right, Hill. We're the only Navy shipyard in Southern California, and uh, but we do have 3,100 civil service employees here. So it's a Naval shipyard with civilian and Navy employees. That's correct. Mostly civilian employees. Well, this is quite a view looking out here at all your cranes. Is that where we're heading right over there? I yes, see the top going, of a ship over there. We're going to go over to dry dock number two for the Antietam. We have three dry docks, and we ha dry dock two is a little smaller than, than dry dock number one. It's only about 650 feet in length. Okay, we're off. Now, how long would these ships be in here, being worked on? Anywhere from three, four months to six months actually being at the shipyard to a year. There are different types of availabilities. This overhaul is scheduled for about a year. 
Where do we go now? We go straight up the steps here. Okay, here we go. Put our hard hats on. Gotta wear the hard hats. Gotta hat. wear the hard hats and safety gear. Okay, here's somebody official standing here to greet us. Hi, I'm Huell Housen. Good morning. Welcome aboard. Now you are the oh you're the commanding officer. You're yeah. the captain here. Captain of the Antietam. That's so right. So you going to give us a little tour of what's here? Sure. Be glad to do what that. What can we see? Anything you want. Well, what would you like to see? Well, let's start. I All don't right, know. Let's I, go on. I'm not sure I know what you got here. Do you want to stay outside mostly, or you want to? Yeah, I guess we'd like to stay outside so we can see the work that's being done here on the on the dry dock. Come on, John. Now, what is involved in dry docking a ship the size of this? Well, Antietam is undergoing a $50 million overhaul. That includes the repair of equipment that's already on board as well as the installation of a number of new systems to keep the ship upgraded and to keep it modern and able to operate at sea. This is what we call the forecastle of the ship and there are a number of items going on up here. Some by the ship's force, the, these are my sailors here working on the helo nets and by the shipyard on the top of this missile launcher. So do, do your sailors and the, ship, the, the, the shipyard workers, they work together this is, uh, on this project. Right, this is very much a joint effort. There are over 400 shipyard workers on the ship uh, on, on the heaviest days, or have been, as well as all the shipyard people over in engineering and design and support services and in the shops, as well as the 350 members of my crew who spend about 60% of their time training and about 40% of their time doing industrial labor here on the ship. In addition to that, there's a whole team of people from the intermediate maintenance activity in San Diego, and we send them various pumps and valves that we don't have the capability to fix ourselves. So you're really taking this ship down to its basics <laughs> and bringing it back. That's right. Uh, you can't see it now, but a 100-foot section out of the sides of both sides was cut completely out with new stiffeners put in. The uh, paint has been removed virtually from the whole superstructure to put on these uh, tiles to lower our radar cross section. And that work started from the top of the mast and is coming all the way down. Wow, this is quite an operation. The, the, this is the vertical launcher here. Uh, the ship operates, of course, in salt water, one of the most corrosive kinds of environments that you can be in. And about every uh, decade, it's necessary to take these systems down to make sure they remain watertight. That's a big part of my job is to keep the water out of the people tank. <laughs> yeah. So you're really getting a new ship out of this thing. Well, we are certainly going to have a better ship uh, when we came out. And the ship was designed to last for about 30 years, but it requires a lot of care because of the environment that we operate in. Now, how long are you going to be here? I asked John. I can't remember what he said. Well, we started this overhaul on October 3rd, and we'll be leaving the end of June. So it's a good eight, six, eight, ten months. Well, uh, yeah, it's about what we'd call a nine-month overhaul, and uh, we're, we're getting a lot of work done. Great effectiveness here by Long Beach Naval Shipyard. You'll be glad to get out to sea again, though, won't you? Well, sure. I'd, I'd much rather be at sea than to uh, be in the yard, but this is an important part of uh, our job in the Navy is to do these overhauls correctly because our capital investment in this ship is huge. Yeah. Can we meet some of the, the workers, sure. John? Where are the... I guess we can go just about anywhere and go almost anywhere. Head in, here. you know, meet it, meet up with them. Here's some guys over here working on. Howdy, fellas. What are y'all working on over here? Well, this fan room over here that uh, that supplies air to the Gaylord hoods down in the galley. Uh huh. Now, how many ships you figure you've worked on in your career here at the shipyard? Well, about a dozen. Really. So you've been here, what, 12, 15 years? Uh, almost uh, 11 years. 11 years. So you average about one ship a year here. Oh, yeah. What are you doing over here? I'm putting all the bolts and nuts in here, uh -huh. tightening up. Is this hard work, or? No, it's just uh, kind of tight to squeeze in some of the tight spots, and a little dirty, but it's not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> 
I noticed you took your earplugs out. You couldn't hear what I was saying, could you? Not too good, no. <laughs> you have to keep your earplugs in most of the time? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, the ships get pretty noisy, and it's real important to keep your earplugs with you all the time. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be out to sea in one of these big ships instead of always working on it here in dry dock? Well, that's one thing I haven't had a chance to do is go on any sea trials, so I haven't uh, been out to sea with any of them before. So you've been here 12 years, you've worked on 12 ships, but you've never been out to sea in any of them? No, uh -uh. Same with you? About the same, yeah. yeah. You ought to take them out for, a, uh, you know, they've never been out to sea. It's, uh, we try we tried to get people out on guest cruises, but uh, it's very it's very difficult in our schedule, yeah. and the uh, operating funds now are very tight, so it's difficult to get people as many people out as you'd like to take. Well, I'll write my congressman and see if we can't arrange for that. We do have a lot of shipyard workers who will go out during sea trials. That's when right before the testing phase to make sure all the work is done. Uh, we've got planners, we've got various uh, mechanics, electricians, people in the trades go out in the ship make sure running various tests to make sure that the ship is up to spec. I want to go down in the bottom and look up and see the ship from the from the dry dock. See you later fellas. Now we're actually going down into the bottom of this huge dry dock and I guarantee you this is a perspective that most people never see. This is literally a ship out of water, Captain. That's correct. <laughs> uh, we've been out of the water now for about six months, and there are things that we can only do in dry dock. For instance, there are 300 hull penetrations, that is, holes in the hull or in the people tank, as I like to call it, where valves keep the water out of the inside of the ship. Those valves have to periodically be cut out with welding torches, then overhauled or replaced. In addition, the entire propulsion train of the ship has been removed from well inside the ship out here. Look at this. Now this, look at the size of these propellers. Yeah, uh, these propellers, or screws as we call them, are really marvels of engineering because these blades move back and forth and that's how we get our reverse thrust is by changing the pitch. So inside this large hub, there are large hydraulic pistons and lots of very fine-tuned control systems. That all had to be disassembled, as well as the shaft. Oh, which look is at the shaft, yeah. The, the shaft actually has uh, long axial tubes that run in there to take the flow of oil to the hub, and a control rod, and also an air mechanism that blows air out of tiny holes in the surface of the screws to lower our noise in the water. Look at all this work that's going on down here, too. This place is a beehive of activity. Let's walk right through here real quickly. Oh, wow. Good morning. Now, what are you supervising? You look like a supervisor standing here. Fire prevention. Fire prevention. <laughs> so you're, are you a member of the crew or a member of the shipyard? Uh, the shipyard. So you're here to ensure that no fires break out during all of this welding that's going on? Exactly. Yes, sir. That's my job. Any fires lately? No, nope, we ain't having it. Well, you're doing a good job. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and here we go over here, doing some welding up here. Well, Boy. That's right, these plates that they're welding on are the access into the inner boot there's a large rubber boot that has to slide around the shaft and that we keep it under pressure to keep the water from coming inside the ship boy this is an amazing sight underneath here looking up at the ship like this it's a big piece of machinery isn't it it certainly is we're about 10,000 tons does this in a funny kind of way, I mean, I know you know a lot about what you're doing, but does this, seeing it like this, does this give even someone like you a new perspective on just what this ship is all about? Uh, oh, sure. Every time you come down and dry dock like this, I mean, you learn something about the ship or you do get a different view because in the water, it's nothing like this at all. I mean, it's, it's more like a sports car, and here you can see what a huge piece of machinery it really is. Yeah. Wow, this is something. Ha! It's 
standing in the bottom of a dry dock underneath this huge ship. Uh, I'm, I might add one thing some of your viewers might be interested in, because uh, I frequently get asked when you paint the hull, which is what we've done here, what do you do about the spots where the supports are holding the hull up? And how do they get painted? And what do you do? Well, the next time we come in the dry dock, we'll actually put these, we'll put these blocks in a different location. So when we paint the hall next time, we'll be painting the spots that are now blocked. So you mean those spots go unpainted until the next time? Well, it has the whatever the original paint job was right. is, is on there. And there are three docking positions. So over the cycle of the ship, uh, dry docking, the blocks go in three different locations. So everything gets painted. Now this is something. We are literally directly underneath the hull of this massive, how heavy is this ship? How many tons? 10,000 tons. Now what would happen if an earthquake <laughs> hit? With well, actually I can answer that because I was in this dry dock on a battleship uh, back in 1989 and uh, when the earthquake, the Long Beach earthquake took place and uh, it shook the ship pretty good, but uh, it's very solid on these blocks, and there's a lot of weight holding it down. The bottom is of this ship's a little bit rounded, but uh, you can see everything's form-fitted. I don't think anything would happen to the ship. Because I got to tell you, I am putting a lot of faith in the strength of these things yeah. right now, because we are literally standing underneath this ship. Well, that, that's right, but you know, the, the ship is being supported much in the way it's being supported in the water because the water is acting with the force on the hull of the buoyancy of the ship and these blocks are spread out across the whole length of the ship and the width to make sure that no individual block is taking more weight than it has yeah. to. Okay, you've reassured me. Yeah. <laughs> I feel better already. Okay. <laughs> well, it was just a question. It wasn't a bad question, was it's it? an excellent question. Be just my luck for an earthquake to hit while we're standing our, underneath it. Our biggest there. danger in an earthquake situation would probably be that the caisson, which has a huge amount of water against it, there was some damage around the outside of the caisson and the dock flooded because right now the water would go inside the ship. We don't, all of these valves and so on are, are open. Wow. Well, that's a problem we're not going to have to deal with, right? I hope not. Got enough problems without worrying about an earthquake. Boy, this is something. Let's see what these guys over here are up to. Good morning. How y'all doing? What are you working on over here? Uh, we're disconnecting the um, temporary services for the ship, so uh -huh. um, so we come out of dry dock. So you mean the whole time they're here, they're hooked up to some kind of cord that gives them the services from, from, from shore? Right, auxiliary power, right. So this power is what's running your ship right now. Right. We, we, we usually will take power from the shore when we come into port to save on our fuel cost instead of making it ourselves. However, in the shipyard, temporary services is your lifeline, both for the industrial work and for lights and power, yeah. because they have to bring in air, they have to bring in welding leads, they have to bring in ventilation. The ship itself does not have any of its normal air conditioning yeah. systems running. So these guys bring in everything we need on board to work. Now what's this big tarp doing over here? This, uh, this tarp is covering our sonar dome. The sonar dome on this ship is uh, like a big rubber radial tire. In fact, that's the way it's constructed. And uh, this is just part of the protection system for the sonar dome because we don't want to get it damaged uh, in any way. Any imperfections in it cause noise in our anti-submarine warfare systems. So this is your sonar down here. Correct, yep. It, well, it's actually covered up here with the protective surface. Underneath that paper, you would see a, a rubber, looks very much like a rubber, smooth rubber tire. Why would I have thought that that would have been on the top of the ship no. instead of underwater? Like well, for sonar sends out sound in the water oh, in the to water. look for That's submarines, okay, and so okay. uh, we, operate it, uh, we operate it down in the environment where the submarines lurk. And here's the door that opens up to let the water in. Yeah, this is called a caisson, and it's, uh, it's like a dam or a door. And, uh, of course, the, the water goes right up there to about the 42-foot mark on the caisson door. And uh, you can see a little bit of leakage under the bottom of it, but it uh, keeps pumped out pretty well. 
Well, thank you very much for the tour. You want to see the anchor chain over here? That's... Oh, yeah, look. Painted four different colors. Yeah, the, uh, the red shot is the one that goes all the way inside the ship. Each shot is 15 fathoms long, fathoms six feet. And uh, the red shot's the last one. The yellow is caution. And the uh, black shots are the ones that we normally have in the water. The white ones are between shots to tell us how much chain we have out in the water. So if we're in real deep water, we might get out to the yellow shot. If we ever get to the red shot, we know we have big problems because the chain is not connected to the ship at the bottom. It's just in a, it's just in a locker and wrapped around a wildcat. That what, that's what controls it. It's not linked inside the ship in any way. So if you lose control of the chain, the whole thing could just run right out. I don't think I've ever seen an anchor laid out like this before. That's a lot of chain. Yeah. How much chain you got there? Well, there are 12 shots, and uh, each shot is 15 fathoms, and each fathom is 6 feet. So it's 12 times 15 <laughs> times 6. Well, thank you very much for the tour. This has been great. Glad to have I you. I think this is something very few of us have ever seen, a ship this size in dry dock. Now we found something interesting here as we were leaving the ship. I ran into another one of the, actually two of the guys from the ship here who were telling us what these things are out in the harbor here. Yes, these barges are set up with our office spaces and also we need to keep a duty section on board to combat any emergency that might come up on the ship, fires, flooding and such. And that way they're on station and they're ready to go over the ship, stand the watches, and they're here 24 hours a day. So when the ship is being dry docked, you move your offices and actually, I guess, people live on these floating barracks exactly. over here. Exactly. And that was a major evolution because all the administrative stuff from the ship was transferred over to the barges. Everything that we didn't need until the end of overhaul was taken and placed in long-term storage. And these stay here, though, all the time, regardless of what ship is being dry docked, right? Right. Now, are you living on one of these barges? Well, one day out of the week, we live on the barges. Because, you see, the duty section that he referred to, they have to have some place to sleep during that duty period. So we have 24-hour duty periods that we have to serve from 8 until 8 every day to make sure that the equipment and et cetera that we have on board is accounted for and is safe. So yes, we do live on there one day a week. So would you rather be on one of those barges or back on your ship? I'd rather be back on good ship Antietam. I mean, it's a nice barge and <laughs> I'd rather be on Antietam. <laughs> is this something that the regular crew members, you get a little antsy after a couple of months, you want to get back out? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, Mr. Hauser, it, it has a lot to do with the fact that for nine months, a year ago, we lived on this ship. You, you get used to it. You get used to, you just get used to walking through it. You get used to being around it. You get used to the whole feel of the ship. It becomes your environment, your home. So when you're not on it, it throws you off a little bit. You got to get used to get, being back on land and et cetera. Yeah. So it, it has that effect on a person. Well, you got to wait a few more months because it's not ready yet. But that's okay. Once it's ready, we'll be there. Now you're the head civilian guy. I'm a project superintendent for the ship, but it's my job to put the team together. That, what do you mean, the team together? Well, it takes a large team to actually do an overhaul. An overhaul is considered one of the most complex industrial activities known to man. So you have to put together the financing, you have to put together the estimate, the customer has to buy the estimate, then you have to put together an execution team, the team that actually comes out here and actually does the work on the ship. Right now on the team, there's about 400 people. So this is a very complicated deal here. Extremely complicated uh, in, in several ways. One, you're taking gear off, repairing it, and putting it back on. You're also, at the same time, doing a lot of ship alterations. About half my work is actually new, upgraded gear going aboard ship. That were ship you in the Navy? No, I was not. Did you, do you wish you were? Uh, at this point, yes. <laughs> Why I've, do you uh, say that? Well, I've been doing it for 29 years, and you never know enough. Yeah. There's always a, there's always a lot out there to learn. You come in every day, there's always something new to learn. Now we've run into Tim Stover, who you identified your job as? A marine pipe fitter. A here. pipe fitter? Yeah. Uh, we're basically like a plumber, a shipboard plumber. Uh -huh. And we do all different piping systems throughout the ship. And each ship has uh, oh, hundreds of miles of ship uh, piping. 
So a lot now, of pipes to. Now, have you always worked on a ship? Uh, yeah, about the past five years since I've been a pipe fitter. Um, I've been here on the ships, all different ships. About the uh, uh, 12th ship I've worked on in five years. Really? Yeah. Now, you don't work out here on deck, do you? No, we work mostly inside. Uh, sometimes we get lucky enough to uh, get a piping system outside, deck drains <laughs> and things like that. But. So we just happened to run in, into you today up on the deck out in the in the sunshine. Yeah, you got lucky. You found me. I happened to come out to have to get some more material, and uh, I can't even remember what I had to get now. <laughs> <laughs> can we look in the captain's, uh, can we look in here sure. and see what's, oh, boy. This has really just been totally gutted out, hasn't it? Right. Actually, we've covered a lot of the equipment so that it doesn't get damaged. One of the problems you have in an overhaul is not damaging the equipment that's not getting repaired. So you have to cover it and protect it very well so that you don't damage it. So that when, when you come in and you take these covers off, like, like what we have here and some of the other covers that we have in the back, that the equipment is in, is in A1 shape still and the ship can bring it up easily. It's funny in here now because under normal circumstances at sea, this place would be... It's a, it's, a, it's a beehive up here. This is where they, you know, steer the ship. This is uh, the bow. This is what the captain sees when he looks, looks down, and it gives you a good shot of what it looks like to be up on the bridge of an Aegis cruiser. And it also shows you the water right out there. This dry dock isn't going to be a dry dock much longer. This. That gate's going to open up, the water's going to come in, and this ship's going to sail out. That's correct. And USS Antietam will, uh, will be looking to try to get underway in a couple of months. This is interesting. This is one of the few times that uh, you'll ever see a hole all the way from the flight deck or the helicopter pad all the way down to the engine room. And we opened this up so that you can get all of the, all of the uh, heavy gear the big pumps, et cetera, that need to go out for repair and get them up here and, and off ship them off of, off of the ship. So we're looking all the way down to the engine room you're, now. You're looking right at the bottom of the engine room right down there. Wow. And all so, of these hatches have been removed all the way down. All the way down. Uh, and we're, In about two weeks, we'll put them all back together and have to restore the mess decks and officers' quarters and everything else that, that this comes up through. But for right now, those are open. They're open just to get the, the big machinery in and out. You know, we didn't even really look at all the stuff going on inside the ship because it's kind of dark inside. It's hard for us to shoot it. There's a lot going on inside. Oh, there's a lot. Actually, most of the work is going on inside the ship. Very little of what you see actually goes on on the outside of the ship. Well, it looked busy enough on the outside <laughs> for us. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. <laughs> Do you think that uh, most of the workers here have a real understanding and appreciation for the history of this shipyard and what it's done over the years? The younger ones coming in, it, it takes about three to five years for somebody who's coming into the shipyard to be good at what they do. Once they become good at what they do, then a lot, they learn a lot about the history of the shipyard. So those people who have been here over three to five years, I'd say, you're, yes, probably correct. And what do you think about this old shipyard? I love it. I love it. It's, uh, it's a challenge. Every day is a challenge. Every day is new. The, uh, the shipyard uh, is very supportive of you when you're out here on what we call the windy corner, because when you take on a project, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, the shipyard supports you. There's a lot of people in the shipyard that are not assigned to the project that support you. And it's like a big family. It's like a very large, large family here. And most everybody knows most everybody. Well, I hope it's got a future. So do I, especially for the people that, uh, that have to be here. I've been here about 30 years. And when I came, it was open. And when I leave, I hope it's open, too. Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation.